Hello, everyone. Here we are, mid uh, March. Well, I guess we're not mid March, it's March 11th, close enough. Um, in the year of 2021, of course, we are still remote, but that doesn't mean we're not going to try to have some fun. Um, and we should be happy because I'm here in Brooklyn, New York right now. It's 66 degrees. Um, there's a huge stimulus coming that's going to boost uh, the wallets of many Americans who've been struggling. Um, you know, the vaccines have been uh, distributed around the country at an accelerated rate. And we all kind of think right now that we may be seeing the end of this thing. There's still some people who I talk to that refuse to believe it. Um, I believe that people were too optimistic early on, and we'll talk about that a little bit. And I think right now people are too pessimistic. I think that people are have been so grown accustomed to this crazy world that we're living in that I think some people think that it's never going to end. And I can assure you it is ending. Um, and ending that is the lockdown or us having to stay at home. Um, in some ways, the world will never be the same. But I think it's going to be a great summer in America. And um, you see companies like Boeing who make aircrafts ramping up production capacity as they continue to get orders from companies like Southwest Airlines and JetBlue. Um, that's a good sign. Um, try, if you want to book, uh, travel this summer, book it now it's going up six to 7% a week. I just booked my Thanksgiving travel to Fro Florida earlier this week. It's, it is going to be an amazing year. I think, I think that we're going to look back on 2021 as quite the Renaissance. And I think some things that went away during the pandemic will end up being beneficiary, uh, beneficial for the economy as painful as it might've been. And I think we're going to see a lot of new concepts, a lot of new businesses, um, a lot of new movements come about. I'm already seeing things like um, NFT, which I'm not going to talk about too much today, but um, Sotheby's held an auction yesterday and an NFT piece of art. And for those of you who don't know, it's essentially digital art that has a token next to it. So people know it's authenticated. It sold for over $70 million, seven zero for a digital piece of art. So we are living in crazy times. The world is changing so fast. And that's what we're here for at Suzy, really, to help um, our customers and to help um, our, our, our industry at large keep their finger on the pulse of the consumer, because that's just what Suzy does as a business. Um, I'm Matt Britton. I'm the CEO and founder of Suzy. Uh, we usually have guests uh, on these webinars. And today, I'm going to be doing it by myself, um, just because there's a lot to cover. And but we are going to have lots of guests coming up this year. This the state of the consumer webinar series has been really transformational for our business. And I think one learning from these webinars is always try to add value. You know, we really don't do these webinars just to try to win business. We want to use our tool to help the industry, to help people understand what's going on. We enjoy doing it. And at the same time, as a byproduct, it really has helped our business. And I think this is the golden age of digital content. It's one of those things that I think will remain after this is that companies are going to have to double down on their ability to connect with people online. Um, I can't see us sending 25 people to the Consumer Electronics Show next year. I could see us sending two people, but I think for us to be able to scale our business, digital content and doing things like these webinars is going to be kind of the way to go. Uh, for those of you who don't know what Suzy is, Suzy is a market research software platform uh, that helps now over 300 enterprise companies have their finger on the pulse of the consumer in real time. We have an always-on consumer panel over, over a million uh, consumers, which could be segmented by a variety of census-based criteria. So if you're on a Zoom or hopefully one day in a meeting and you want to know what consumers think about a concept, pricing, packaging, all you need to do is ask Suzy. And for those of you who are on this webinar right now that are already using Suzy, I just want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for continuing to support our organization. We are now up to about 140, 150 people. Uh, when the pandemic started, we had 60, so we're growing as a team. Growing a company in the midst of a pandemic when you're working remote is something that I'll never forget. I can't wait to meet a lot of our new employees that we haven't been able to meet yet, but um, we're definitely onto something big at Suzy, and we've had recent product announcements, um, including Suzy Live, the ability to execute on-demand focus groups, um, and something called Suzy Solutions that we that we just launched yesterday that allows clients to really use template and benchmark solutions um, to execute research. We're really just trying to democratize market research. We can almost think of us as direct-to-consumer market research, eliminating um, the middleman, um, you know, 
making it more efficient uh, and really more accessible for everybody to understand the consumer. And again, right now, you really do need to understand the consumer. Um, we are going to be referencing some research today. The research reference during our study today um, was uh, based on a sample size of a thousand um, American consumers, directionally representative um, of sense uh, across age, gender, ethnicity, and region. So uh, I was going through my LinkedIn and my Twitter from last year. I think many of us were because it's just fascinating to see how we were sort of responding to the onset of this pandemic in real time. Um, and I actually almost sent this tweet out. I think I posted it on Facebook in January. And I always worry, I don't want to freak people out. I don't want to freak our employees out. But I was feeling it very early on. And I wrote, everyone thought the year 2000 was going to reshape the world. Um, typo there. Uh, but it's clear that it's going to be the year 2020. As for the US, the range of outcomes for this nation by the end of this year has never been wider. We have absolutely no idea what world we'll be living in in 2021. Now, at that time where my mind was, and you can see I sent this out at one o'clock in the morning when I often do my best thinking, was I saw what was happening um, in China with this pandemic starting to sort of um, get to an extent where it was very worrisome. We didn't know what was going to be happening in the political landscape. There were just so many unknowns. It was a scary time. I, you know, I think that things have settled down a lot right now. And I think right now, a year later, I think there's far less uncertainty in the world. I do think that we're living in a little bit of a bubble, which we can talk about. Um, but obviously, it's nice to be in a time right now where it's almost the polar opposite of the uncertainty that we were facing uh, last year. I, I posted this at a certain point. I'm like, you know what? Screw it. I need to say how I feel. I wrote, I don't mean to be an alarmist, but I think there's a 50% chance that major business events like South by Southwest will be canceled outright. Now, this was in mid-February. The comments were crazy. Everyone thought I was crazy. They thought we would be able to just hand out um, you know, some uh, hand sanitizers and everyone would wash their hands and we'd still have South by Southwest. I also talked about how we're making staff in contingency programs, and we really jumped ahead of it in terms of making sure that when that call came or when that news announcement came, our company would know how to operate. Um, we're doing the same thing right now. We are making plans right now on the other side of this. What does our office look like? How are we going to get together? We are acting as if the world is going to go back to 2019 state. And I think being ahead of things in business, no matter how big or small your company is, will always put you on the right side of history. Um, but you, you kind of saw these things happening. A lot of people tend to deny uh, what they're seeing. South by Southwest was the thing, obviously, that got my audience going because you know a lot of people look forward to that sort of as an annual rite of passage. So this was uh, March 9th. I was asked to present at a conference um, before this pandemic hit. I spoke around the world. I did anywhere between 40 to 60 um, speaking engagements uh, on literally every continent in the world besides Antarctica. Um, and I was asked to speak a long time ago. I committed to a, a keynote in, uh, on March 9th in Miami. And this was the week when, in fact, the day after this is when, um, you know, Tom Hanks got announced that he had COVID. It might have been that Wednesday. Uh, this was on a Monday. Uh, but so it was that week where really the world changed. And I really didn't want to go. Um, and my family didn't want me to go. And, you know, it was a very risky scenario. I was sort of a little bit ahead of, I think, where most people were in terms of, um, you know, what this pandemic was going to do. And you could see my opening line, welcome to the last conference ever on earth. <laughs> I tried to really make it something that was, um, you know, humorous and kind of the break the tension. The conference, which was thrown by a company by Burrell, was jam-packed. Every seat was full. In fact, um, I think it was the the prime minister of Brazil, I, don't, I hope that's a like, pro political uh, title, but the guy who runs Brazil, he was speaking in the big conference room next to me um, at this hotel ballroom. And it came out two weeks later that him and his entire staff had contacted COVID, which obviously, you know, I felt like I dodged the bullet. But um, the show must go on. I went there begrudgingly. Um, that was the last live keynote I gave that happened to be the week um, where all this happened. Um, I had about 18 um Global keynotes get canceled last year, many of which are, are rescheduled this year in October and November, um, where I'm not going to be literally on the ground a lot because I'm going to be flying to all these things. I think right now those events are all going to happen. I think right now we there will be large conferences back this fall, um, and the conference producers are acting as if they will as well. Um, we also in March knew, as I mentioned earlier, is the opportunity really to start to launch um, a content series. Nobody knew what was going on. Uh, nobody knew what, how it was going to impact their business. 
we didn't know what was going on, but we know we could ask the consumer. And that's really what you can always do is, is understand how the consumer is thinking and feeling. Um, and we launched our first webinar, State of the Consumer webinar, a year ago. Uh, we had about 250 people. It was very poorly produced. Um, I didn't have a fancy setup like I do right now. But we knew right away that this was something that we needed to invest in. And it's something that we're going to continue to hopefully one day even turn State of the Consumer into a live event. Um, in around April, we made the announcement uh, that we are going to be shutting down our office for all of 2020. Uh, it was really sad. Um, I think a lot of our employees were hoping that we would get back together. Um, again, at this point, we had about 65 employees. We were one of the first companies in New York City to make this announcement. I guess it looks like we had 80 employees then. Um, and some people thought that we were being a little too hasty with that decision, but we really wanted to give people the opportunity to travel, spend more time with family, maybe not pay rent on their apartments. Um, our office lease was expiring in July and you know we didn't want to renew it and we didn't and we haven't paid office rent since, um, which has been great because we've been able to reinvest in our product. Um, I do think we wanted office. I know we wanted office, but it was certainly helpful to not have to pay for rent when we weren't using it. But we were one of the first to make that announcement. It was very tough on culture. Um, and we've been going ever since with these state of the consumer reports. So um, as we look to next year, or I guess this year in 2021, we have to look back to last year, 2020, in terms of the trade-off that happened. Because I think when you look back, and we're seeing this happen right now, um, in the stock market, for example, in the last couple of weeks, there has been a huge focus on legacy companies uh, that have been really the darling of Wall Street. I'm talking about um, companies like Boeing um, and companies like General Electric, uh, companies that were really big um, kind of blue chip companies 10, 15 years ago um, before the days of you know Facebook, Apple, Amazon, Netflix, Google. Those stocks and those companies become out of favor on Wall Street. There's a shift back to value. There's a shift back to basics. And I think that's really emblematic of the consumer. Last year, our, the, the U.S. consumer had more comfort than ever before. Um, savings rates were and still are an all-time high. People spent more time with their family. Time was something that they just had so much of right? Um, they were investing in their homes. They were focusing on their health. Um, they were as comfortable as possible. So the comfort meter was at 100, but their excitement and adventure meter was on zero. No travel, no sporting events, no outdoor dining um, or indoor dining, I should say. Not a lot of, whole lot of serendipity, not a whole lot of romance for people who are single and for people who are married in a lot of instances. And I think, so that comfort came at the expense of excitement. And now what you're starting to see happen is that shift occur. We're tired of being comfortable. We're tired of uh, laying around our Lululemons and watching Netflix, right? People want to get out there. Uh, we're seeing that happen again in, in the travel industry. We're seeing um, you know, people uh, buy tickets to events, uh, record paces for September and October. We are going to have a renaissance of experience that's going to be coming back. It's going to be a whiplash effect that I don't think much of the uh, economy is actually ready for. And along with that whole comfort to excitement story, and we'll talk about this, people were moving out of cities. Uh, they want to be comfortable in the suburbs with their space. And they traded away the connectivity and the community of cities for the space and privacy of suburbs, which was really a reversal of a trend that millennials had sort of um, been going against for years where urbanization was becoming sort of a massive trend and it was transforming the economy. We saw a whiplash. I actually think we might say a whiplash back to cities. Um, and we'll talk about that. Um, and as we look to next this year in 2020, um, I believe that really the businesses that are going to win are going to have to uh, embrace one of these three or two of these three, or hopefully even three of these three aspects, speed, safety, and connection. So let's talk about what they mean. Speed, first and foremost, while in 2020, we may have had limitless time, in 2021, I think time is going to be far less of a commodity that we can afford to spend and give away. One thing I'm not hearing a lot of is what consumers are going to be doing less of in 2021 that they did in 2020. We keep hearing that consumers are going to be traveling more and shopping more and kind of getting out there more, but there's only 24 hours in a day. So anything that consumers uh, were spending a lot of time doing in 2020, they might not have as much time to do those things in 2021. 
Um, that's why I disagree when a lot of um, kind of pundits say, oh, e-commerce is never going to see the run that it had in 2020 again, because the reality is that e-commerce saves you time. And anything that saves you time is going to be even more in demand in 2021 because consumers are going to have a lot more things to do. So, you know, today on Wall Street, some of the highest traded stocks are companies like Discovery and Viacom who came out with new streaming platforms. And they, I'm sure they're going to be wonderful. But the reality is, is streaming going to be down because people aren't going to be home as much next year? So I think we don't talk enough about where that time is going to go because all this new stuff consumers are doing are going to come at the expense of things that they might have been doing a lot of in 2020. Um, so we're going to unpack today uh, four major um, trends uh, that you know, really reflect the lifestyle uh, changes that we've made to date um, as consumers. Um, and they're going to be in four categories, health, home, work, and happiness. Um, as you know, those of you who have been sort of uh, loyal viewers of our State of the Consumer series, um, my trusty um, colleague, Abel Flint, um, pops in to do these sort of Ask America segments where we're able to basically ask our cons uh, consumer panel using Susie questions based upon the question that you actually want to get most answered. So Abel, why don't we just jump on here now, um, just because I'm looking at the time and I want to make sure we cover everything. Our first topic is going to be health. So Abel's going to jump in right now and um, we are going to have you actually ask us um, from at least four questions. What do you want us to actually ask our consumer? Um, first one is around health. One, will you continue to telehealth appointments post pandemic? Two, what type of telehealth routine will you maintain? Three, did you find that you made more or less doctor appointments due to access to online consultations? And four, do you expect you will continue to care about health and wellness even more post pandemic? So you can actually submit what uh, question um, you would like us to have um, our, our consumer panel answer. And at the end, Abel will hop on and we'll go over the results. And really, this is just to showcase the speed and ease of use um, of our Suzy tool. So I'm going to have some water. And while you guys answer that question, we're going to um, get ready to jump into our first topic of health. So within the first month of COVID-19, telehealth visits increased 154%. And to me, this is really emblematic of kind of forced disruption. And the best analogy for forced disruption is the vaccines, right? We knew for a very long time that it took five to seven years for a vaccine to go to market. And here we are one year later, and you said not everyone's quite 100% comfortable with it, but we got a vaccine out that was proven um, through clinical trials to be quite effective in one year. So maybe it was always possible to get it out within one year. Um, it just took a forced disruption for it to happen, right? It's almost like somebody who can't wake up in the morning and all of a sudden, you know, they find themselves, um, you know, in the army or they have a job where they have to wake up early and all of a sudden they realize they actually can wake up. They just didn't want to. Um, I look at a lot of industries like that where forced disruption has occurred because we had no other choice. Theoretically, telehealth should have been a thing for the past decade, but it wasn't because the medical healthcare industry, like financial services, like the legal industry, like uh, so many other industries that have sort of been sort of hanging on um, to legacy systems, legacy companies, they were forced to adopt new platforms, new ways of doing business. And as a result, you saw a boom of telehealth out of really no other choice that happened. Um, nearly 50% of people have utilized telehealth within the last year alone. Um, and out of those, over 50% never even used it before. So you're bringing new entrants um, into a space who, by the way, aren't going to be rushing to go to the doctor's office moving forward. I think this is the this will happen in many industries. I think if I'm a law firm that's spending so much money on an expensive midtown office space, if you think about what lawyers do, there's not a whole lot of collaboration. They have, if you went ever went to a law firm's office, they all have their own office and they're all kind of working on their own at their desk. And then they meet with clients. All of that could be done remotely. So, uh, you know, accounting services the same way. I think a lot of service businesses are going to realize they're the ones that don't need the office spaces versus tech companies that are far more collaborative um, by nature are going to be the ones that actually do. And I think that's counter to what most people think. Um, you know, Amazon, no surprise, jumped into telehealth. And I think, you know, when you're a big company like Amazon or Google, 
you're not going to jump into an industry unless there's trillions of dollars behind it because you need to really move the stock price and move growth in the company. And, you know, the healthcare space is one of the last bastions of, um, you know, disruption in the business world. So I think you're going to see Walmart and Amazon, and these big companies dive in just because this is an industry with so many zeros behind it. Um, it's not just physical health, it's mental health. Um, as somebody who's now running a company with, um, you know, well over 100 employees, I can tell you that a lot of people in our company are struggling. It's a very hard time. It's not easy to sit in front of a screen all day. Um, anxiety and depression uh, has been a big issue for many Americans. Um, more than 40% of the people surveyed by the Census Bureau reported symptoms, um, and that's up 11% from the previous year. And I think when, whether you're talking about medication, uh, meditation, um, medication too, um, online therapy, I think this is going to be really here to stay. It's really sort of accelerated um, that, that boom as well. Um, and I think a lot of employers and health uh, providers have really struggled to meet the demand of mental health, where it obviously has been a taboo for so long. It's now being uh, much more widely embraced in our society. And I definitely think that COVID has been a beneficiary um, of that. Uh, people have also missed doctor appointments due to COVID-related obstacles. Um, if you know anyone in the medical field, what they'll tell you is with COVID down, their their hospitals are empty or never because people have pushed off checkups, they've pushed off surgeries, using almost COVID as an excuse. And the medical industry um, and a lot of hospitals are really struggling for business right now, as crazy as that sounds. And they're going to really have to try to, you know, uh, have public awareness that you need to take care of yourself. And actually, some instances, come in and see the doctor, come in and get things taken care of. So there could be an overcorrection uh, to telehealth. So, you know, we asked the uh, consumers, is telehealth here to stay? And consumers said, yes, they say it's convenient, easy and effective. And, um, you know, we think that people are going to embrace it more. And mo most importantly, the kind of institutional complex of the medical industry will. 70% um, of people feel their lifestyle is the same, if not healthier since the onset of COVID. Uh, I think some people have used this as an opportunity, this extra time that they've had to take care of themselves. No other company has benefited from that more than Peloton, right? Uh, there's a company called Mirror, which is a connected in-home fitness device that was purchased by Lululemon for $500 million. So, you know, in-home health has really taken off and the consumers who I think were um, kind of physically fit minded, if you will, were ones that took advantage of the extra time and um, actually really were able to take care of themselves and they created the rise of virtual fitness classes, etc. You know, I'm kind of down the middle on this. I think that for young single people, the gym is also a social experience. And I think that people are kind of tired of being in their living rooms. And I'm not so sure that people are, are going to once the world opens up going to want to buy a Peloton to basically force them to be home more um, as convenient as it may be, especially over the summer months, perhaps when we hit the winter months and people like being home again, Peloton will see a resurgence, but you know, I wouldn't be so quick to write off gyms. There's one right under my building in Brooklyn. It's already filling up. I think people need that social interaction to, you know, feel connected when they're exercising or frankly uh, doing anything else. Um, obviously, you know, the larger focus overall on health and wellness um, and also financial goals really uh, has hit consumers front and center. Health is is front and center. If you were in an industry that sells uh, vitamins or supplements um, or anything that really focuses on organic or healthy eating, um, even companies like um, Impossible Burger and Beyond Meat, those companies are doing incredibly well. Oatly, the you know, I think is one of the fastest growing um, food and beverage companies in the world right now. Consumers are really starting to relook at their health because the pandemic has taught us that we can no longer really take uh, that for granted. 78% um, of people, this is kind of going beyond um, exercising, but just mass, mass wearing. I thought this is really interesting. Um, nearly 80% of people said they plan to wear a mask for some, if not all occasions after the COVID crisis is over. This is a fascinating topic. What is going to happen um, once, it, say we're in October or November, people are traveling for Thanksgiving, you know, is that Delta flight from uh, LaGuardia to Fort Lauderdale going to be full of people wearing masks? When you go to a conference and you see a longtime friend um, who you haven't seen in years, are you going to want to give them a hug? Are they going to want to give you a hug? Are they going to be wearing a mask? These social cues are going to be fascinating. And I think the issue is it's going to just be I remember right when it was first starting, um, we were looking at office space because, you know, we were kind of going down a path that maybe we'll get an office space when our lease ends, et cetera. And 
my, uh, our real estate broker, who's a longtime friend of mine, came out to me. He's like, hug, fist bump, et cetera. Like he didn't know what to do. And we ended up going with the fist bump, right? So is the fist bump going to be the new hug? Uh, are double kisses going to still be a, a thing for people who maybe have an accent like they're from UK, but maybe not? Like, you know, I don't know how that's going to play out moving forward, but I do know that there's going to be a lot of awkward moments that are going to start to occur as people do not know how to interact with each other socially. And it's really opportunities, I think, for brands to help consumers uh, really navigate it. But this was a big number. Almost 80% of people said they plan to wear a mask uh, for some, if not all occasions. Um, we'll see if that actually uh, manifests. People are, are increasingly having a more positive view of vaccines. When it first came out, the worry was that nobody wanted to take it. There obviously still is a, a sector of America, uh, rightly or wrongly, that just don't trust the vaccine. Uh, the fact that it came out a year when it usually takes five to seven years, like I said earlier, freaks a lot of people out and they don't know the long-term implications. You know, it's not open to the public yet. It's really just been for people with comorbidities and the elder population. We're going to see very quickly uh, in the next six weeks, uh, because President Biden said that by May, there will be enough supply to really vaccinate the entire country. We're going to see really quickly how many people really do want to take the vaccine um, or don't because, you know, the pedal is going to hit the metal and it's going to be widely available. So that's going to be interesting to see. Um, so the implications for brands of all these things that we talked about is brands need to innovate their digital offerings for the long haul. Um, you know, we I don't think e-commerce is going away. I don't think digital content is going away. Uh, there is going to be a shift. Um, health and wellness trends are going to continue to bro uh, grow. Uh, you know, do brands have a right to fit in um, in that dialogue? And, you know, I think that brands can really help consumers navigate the recovery. Uh, I think there's, again, there's not going to be a light switch that turns on that tells consumers it's okay to act like it's 2019 again. Brands are, and many consumers will tell you, and they've told us through our research, they trust brands more than they trust the government. Um, that was certainly the case um, last year in our research that we did. Brands can play a role in helping consumers navigate this as we, um, you know, continue to, to address this recovery as a nation. So that's health, our first topic. Our next topic is home. Um, and before we dive in, we're going to go into our Ask America. Uh, and you can tell us which question you want us to ask the Susie audience about homes. One, where you could have us ask, are you considering moving homes in the next six months? Two, if you have moved during the past year, do you regret it? Three, how likely are you to move to a different state in the next six months? And four, are you planning to make home improvements in the near future? So you can answer that as I just did on what question you'd like our panel to answer. And we will go into our next topic. 46% of people said proximity to family and friends was their number one priority of determining where to live even prior to COVID. So I have lots of friends. You know, it's funny because... You talk to people who are uh, like you and you think based upon their answers sometimes that that's what everybody thinks. So for example, I have friends that are in their mid forties, a lot of which are well-to-do that have kids that are 10, 12, 15 years old that are, that moved out of New York city uh, in the past six months. And they'd moved to Florida or they moved to Connecticut or upstate New York. And they'll tell you that New York city is dead. But the reality is for them, it was an easy choice because their kids are at the end of their schooling, going into college. So maybe it's okay to go to a different school. Um, maybe that you're talking to people who've lived in New York City for now 20 years, who the, the kind of social and adventure driven characteristics aren't as important. And those people are the people who are on CNBC and are interviewed by the New York Times and are the people that tend to be more influential. And they start to create this narrative that cities are dead because their friends are telling them that cities are dead. And I think the reality is, is it is based upon life stage. People who were planning on vacating cities, this was the ultimate excuse to accelerate it. In fact, it was interesting, a very popular fashion and lifestyle blogger, something Navy, um, she actually announced to her audience that she was moving to Long Island um, at, you know, after she was done with her stint in Miami for the winter. And then she actually made a U-turn and said, you know what? Nope, we're going back to New York City. And I think that was really interesting. And I think you know, it shows that she understood and she's built a great brand, had a big misstep at the beginning of the pandemic. But she realized that for her to be a lifestyle and fashion blogger to ha that has their finger on the edge of, uh, of culture – and, and trends and, uh, you know, that she can't live in the suburbs doing that. 
people really, when they follow a lifestyle or fashion blogger like Sunny Navy, a big part is understanding their lifestyle and a lifestyle in a, a, a thriving metropolis is often a lot more exciting. Nothing against suburban lifestyle, but not for a fashion blogger. Um, so that was really interesting to see that that U-turn happen. And I think you're going to be really seeing a lot more of it. At the same time, you know, JP Morgan Chase, one of the largest employers in New York, announced that they're putting up some of their office space for rent. Uh, and you know, that's a big deal because in New York City, you know, you look at the American Express, JP Morgan's, Goldman Sachs, they're the biggest tenants of commercial real estate. So if they start to say, we don't want to be here anymore, well, maybe that does push the other way. So we're really kind of in this period where we don't really know what's going to happen. Um, but for for putting aside where people work, this has really made a lot of consumers question kind of where they want to live. Um, some consumers have moved and loved it. We've seen a rush with the younger generation, not so much the suburban locales, but to what we'll call secondary and tertiary cities. Obviously, some are like Austin, Texas, um, which has tax advantages, right, because of their of their uh, zero based um, personal income tax, um, as well as the weather. You see a lot of people moving to Austin. You see a lot of people moving to Miami. So weather and taxes has been a big driver of people moving out of places like New York City and San Francisco. It's going to be interesting. I think San Francisco is probably going to be have a lot more pressure just because it had so many more social issues kind of coming into this. And you've already seen companies like Oracle uh, move to Austin and a lot of entrepreneurs in Silicon Valley uh, move out where New York is heavily rooted um, in the financial system, which Wall Street is not going anywhere. I think ultimately, despite what JP Morgan Chase said, the big banks aren't going anywhere. I think the advertising industry is not going anywhere. Um, there's way, way more of an allure to tourism in New York City. So maybe I'm just biased, but I think New York City is is going to be okay. I think Los Angeles is going to be okay. San Francisco, they, it might take a hit, but eventually that will probably rebound too, because California is one of the most beautiful places in the world. But it, but a lot of people have been moving to not only uh, places like Austin and Miami, but moving to places like Charlotte and Salt Lake City and other areas where real estate is a lot uh, more cheap. Maybe the weather and the outdoor life is a lot better. And it's going to be interesting to see how that changes uh, culture. So yes, they move west and south. Um, the, the real estate market has never been hotter. Uh, there's a bunch of reasons why. Uh, things like the cost of lumber right now are at an all-time high. Um, so building homes are more expensive. Building new homes are more expensive than ever before. So it's much easier to purchase a home. Um, until about a week ago, uh, mortgage rates were at an all-time low. So it was easy to finance. You could afford more of a house. And the demand was really limitless. Uh, it was a great time to buy low in New York City, probably not a great time to buy high um, in Greenwich, Connecticut. Um, I almost like in this period that we've seen the last six months to right after 9-11. Uh, I was working for a guy in New York City after 9-11 who went down to downtown New York and bought three townhouses in Tribeca on September 18th, 2001. Uh, it's safe to say those investments paid off pretty well for him. Right. So I think it's it's been a good time to invest um, in cities in the past uh, couple of months. And again, I do think it's going to be uh, roaring back. So you can see previously people really wanted to be, um, you know, more in urban uh of more in suburban locations. And now you can see there's a big rise. Um, the, the urban locales recently are coming back as where people want to be again. Um, and I do think it's going to be this fall. Uh, I think this summer you're going to see just an insane amount of domestic travel, um, not international travel, because I think that international travel is going to, A, a lot of other nations aren't allowing Americans there uh, yet. But I think even when they do, I think since companies are not going to be likely investing in international travel, those business class international seats subsidize coach seats for consumer travel to Europe. So I think it's going to be a price prohibitive for many consumers, and they're going to be traveling domestically. So I think we're going to have a domestic travel uh, boom uh, this this summer. And domestic operators like Southwest Airlines and JetBlue, that's why they're buying the planes from Boeing. I think after that, when we settle into the fall, I think that the cities are going to have a massive rebound. Uh, and a big reason why is schools. Schools will be fully opened. A lot, it was easier for a lot of families to move out when it was remote. A lot of companies like like Susie are going to be reopening. And there's going to be a renaissance in cities this fall. Mark my words on that. I'm glad this is being recorded. So I'm not a fan of this trend that everyone's fleeing urban areas. Um, I just, I think it works for some people. For young people, 
They want access to culture. They want access to a social life. They want experiences. Those experiences are not going to happen um, on a farm, right? Unless Woodstock is taking place, um, where you know, like right they are taking place in cities. So I think again. I just don't believe that. And I think wherever the the youth goes, and this is the thesis of my book, Youth Nation, which is uh, right back here, um, which is a little dated at this point, but still a lot of the themes reign true. You know, we're in a youth-driven culture and youth-driven society right now. The trends that impact the world, like NFTs more recently, or cryptocurrency, or Red Bull, or the iPhone, right, or Facebook, they all start it with younger people. They start it on the sidewalks and they work their way up to the boardroom. We don't live in a world anymore where the boardroom dictates culture down. It's the sidewalks dictating culture up. And if young people are in the cities, the talent will be in the cities and the influencers and the culture will be on the cities. And despite what JP Morgan says, they're going to go back to the cities as well because they're going to want to be near the center of that nexus. So I think that's how the shift happens. It's the younger people that are going to be deciding this, not the older consumers who are talking to their friends that are reinforcing their biases of what's going to um, actually go on. And we talked about sort of this K-shaped recovery. At the same time, a lot of people are still facing evictions. So... It is just such an interesting world right now where K-shaped recovery means you, you have professional workers that have a lot of which have thrived during this. And you have blue collar workers who have really struggled, restaurant workers, um, you know, public uh, officials and who've gotten budgets cut. So, you know, you still have people that have risks of evictions. And I think hopefully the stimulus, the two trillion that just got approved by the president today gets into the hands of those who need it. Um, we all know that with the PPP loans that happened earlier in 2020, that wasn't always the case. So um, hopefully, you know, there's going to be a trickle down to the people who really need uh, those funds. Um, so the brand implications, brands need to go uh, beyond products and offer community. I think that's a huge implication, which is that Brands now need to kind of connect the dots on what community looks like in a post-pandemic world because there is going to be sort of a scatter at first of some people living in suburbs, some people living in cities, some people going to the office, some people not. I think people are going to crave community. I also think brands have an opportunity to invest in experiences. Right now, the cost of commercial real estate in major cities is dramatically low. And I think tech companies like, you know, Microsoft or uh, Shopify, these are companies that have thrived online during the pandemic. And what I think they're going to start to do is take the excess capital and, and take advantage of depressed real estate costs to invest in experiences. So if I were Netflix, I would buy a movie theater chain and I would actually bring my Netflix brand to life in theaters as sort of like an added benefit for my subscribers so they can touch and feel. If I were Xbox, I would, uh, you know, invest in physical video game tournaments tournament sites where people can come and I can immerse my experience there. If I were Nike, I would invest in um, gyms where kids can play basketball indoors in cities where it's cold. Uh, you know, these experiences now are going to matter more than ever because consumers crave it. And it's, it's suddenly become, you know, I think not as cost prohibitive for brands to be able uh, to invest in this. So I think um, it's going to be really interesting. Homes, obviously, they've taken on a multifunctional role. Where do brands fit in the home? Um, and what I mean by that is the home during the pandemic has become the school, it's become the office, it's become the gym. I do think consumers are going to be spending less time in the office uh, com coming out of this than they were um, in 2019. It, they may not not go to the office at all, but certainly they need more space. I think that, you know, the home has just become far more valuable as a palette for investment. And I think that companies need to find their way into this new home uh, for sure. Um, and I think that, you know, there will be a notion of socially distanced that uh, world that happens coming out of this. You know, I think a company like Zoom is here to stay. I think when we look at our new office, for Susie, um, if you've ever been in the Soho house or say the lobby of a really swank hotel, that's where I want our office to be. I want our, but it's going to be also decked out with Zoom stations. So if people come in, it's going to be so they can collaborate. If they are just going to work and make phone calls all day, then they can do that from home. So it's going to be about culture, collaboration. I think the best companies use culture as a secret weapon. That is our plan uh, for offices. And, um, you know, I'm excited to to kind of experiment um, in that world, um, you know, as a business. 
So um, work, you know, I've talked about some of these things. Um, those of you who see me present before, sometimes I go off on tangent. So I actually may have covered some of the stuff in the work section in the home section, but they're very connected. But, you know, what question you want to ask our consumers? One, are you looking forward to go back in the office? Two, what are some work perks you'd consider a new job? Three, how many days a week would you like to go back to the office? And four, how would you like brands to help you transition? So you could pick the question you want us to ask our Susie audience, and we will go into our next section. Okay. So let's talk about the great divide is core. You know, nearly 40% of people lost their job due to COVID-19. Uh, there is a comeback. The, the unemployment rate, I think, now is down uh, to about 7%. It got as high as 12 to 13%. So the recovery is here. I think the good thing about the stimulus bill is a lot of it is going to help restaurants. And I think that that industry will come back. I think that there are a lot of people who were got the wrong end of the stick. And, you know, a lot of family businesses went out of business, but people are dying to eat out again. And I think that you're going to see a renaissance of restaurants. That, and again, with the depressed commercial real estate costs, I definitely think it's going to happen. But it is this kind of, we talk about the grand divide or the K-shaped recovery, 40% of the people lost their jobs and nearly 50% of people started a business and used stimulus money to do it. So we are living in a tale of two worlds. And it's important to kind of remember that. Uh, moving forward, obviously, we know the stories of the one percent and how you know the billionaires have made more wealth during the pandemic than the rest of the world combined. You know, we know about wealth disparity as an issue in this country. We have shifted now to um, a very um, liberal, far more liberal government structure than we had last year. Uh, I think that will be impacting the tax structure. There's talks, Elizabeth Warren talks about a wealth tax uh, to be able to tax um, the 1%. You're going to see a shift starting to happen. Um, you know, some of you may remember a decade ago, the Occupy Wall Street movement, where people were really pushing back against big banks, earning all the money, and people were really feeling disenfranchised. You know, there's an Occupy Silicon Valley movement going on right now. Uh, and obviously, you know, Mar uh, Mark Zuckerberg has, for a lot of people, become sort of public enemy number one. Um, you know, you have people like Elon Musk ha that have kind of escaped scrutiny and have, have kind of transitioned themselves to being a cult hero. But I think that these these companies are real, or these entrepreneurs and, and billionaires are really going to have to figure out are they going to want to get ahead of this or not? Um, there's obviously anti-competitive practices uh, that are being investigated, uh, you know, by the FTC. So, you know, this is going to be an issue that's going to pop up. And, and you know, with a Democrat House and Congress and president, I think you're going to see taxes uh, become raised. I think capital gains taxes are going to be raised. I think taxes on the wealthy are going to be raised. And one thing we've done a great job at, Susie, is really not trying to be um, pick one side or the other in terms of politics. I'm just reporting what's actually happening. Um, I leave my politics for um, not webinar um, environments. Um, so uh, half of people are comfortably working from home, at least sometimes. I think that's the case. I think people have gotten into a groove in terms of how to work at home. Um, but I think the other half are probably people who don't have the space. We've had some employees have had to work out of closets um, because there's other significant others working in their studio and they only have one room. So I think once people can get out, work in the park, work in a Starbucks, work in, in a WeWork, they're going to want to do it. They've gotten comfortable, but that's at really out of necessity uh, versus uh, choice. Um, 90 percent of people are hoping to remain some amount of working from home. I would put myself in that 90% of people. I love the office, but I wouldn't mind on Fridays not having to go in from time to time and not having people think that I'm not working. It's just not as taboo anymore. So I think that's why I think no one's canceling their Zoom subscriptions anytime soon. I think that flexibility will always now be a part of life, um, especially in a world where you can do so much on your computing uh, device. It's also, by the way, created a massive resurgence of interest in buying laptops. So when we went into this crisis, nobody was looking to buy a laptop, you know, and you see it in like HP and Dell stock prices, uh, who, which have both really uh, went on quite a tear because all of a sudden, each kid needs their own laptop during the day to, to do remote schooling. Each adult needs it to do remote working. And now we have way more laptops and desktop computing in the home that we ever thought we had. Going into this, we thought it was all mobile, mobile commerce, mobile commuting, uh, mobile computing. Uh, people were telling companies, don't worry about your e-commerce experience for desktop. No one's on that anymore. Well, I think the desktop is 
here to stay because people aren't going to be working from home from their phones. So that's just an interesting kind of side nugget uh, for businesses. Um, so what's important in a job these days uh, from money and fulfillment, obviously, to money and safety? I think consumers want safety. There's talk about companies saying that you have to get a vaccine to go into an office. There's going to be a lot of um, you know, lawsuits and a lot of uh, issues coming out. It's not, not going to be an easy time to be an HR executive. We have one of the best in the world, Anthony Ernesto. And Anthony and I talk all the time just about how we're going to sort of reopen the office to make people feel safe, but not make people feel disenfranchised. Um, it's going to be a balancing act for sure, because when you talk about people's health and privacy, they're hypersensitive to it. And, you know, you don't want to be the one that tells an employee they can't come in because they're not vaccinated because maybe for, for a lot of reasons, including they just don't want to, uh, you know, that they're not vaccinated. And, and does that mean they can't work in the office? And how are companies going to deal with that? Um, I think that there's going to be a lot of restaurants and airlines and hotels that are going to want only people that are vaccinated to go into their establishments. Is there going to be an identity system? Uh, the European Union is already talking about a universal identity system for those who have been vaccinated. There's no script for this. It's going to be really interesting uh, to see how um, this whole thing unfolds. And, you know, I think that, Generally speaking, it's going to be up to each company to figure out how to execute in a way that really embraces their own culture, their own level of productivity uh, to make the decisions of if and when they're going to go back to an office environment. I will say that I believe that younger people need an office. They need that experience. They need to feel connected. I think that for me, you know, we have over 100 employees that I've never met before. And the employees that I have met before, I just have a different connection with them because, you know, you have a different connection with people who you've met in person that versus people who um, you haven't. We did one outdoor event at Governor's Island in October, and I saw one of our new employees, and he was, like, incredibly tall. And I just had no idea because I just saw him over Zoom. So I didn't even know how tall the guy was. I think – that just goes to show that we need to have these personal connections. And we're, again, us at Suzy, going to really try to overinvest in it. Um, the last section is happiness. So this is the last question we're going to be asking people. One of these four questions, uh, what would you like us to ask? What are some things that are making you happy right now? What makes you happy when thinking about the future? Do you think your happiness level will be the same post-pandemic as pre-pandemic? And what brands do you associate with happiness right now? So you can pick the question you want us to ask our audience, and we are going to go into our last section about happiness. Um, as we mentioned, COVID has had an incredible impact on our mental and overall emotional state. Uh, here's some quotes from our, our Susie panel. Um, some people says, made me appreciate my life more. It's made me feel grateful for my friendships, my job, and my health. Other people said it because I have no friends to go out with. I just keep everything to myself. I have no interaction with anyone. Those are two polar opposites, right? So we talk about the great divide. Some people have thrived. There's introverts that just have loved, you know, their new lifestyle. You know, I'm kind of over it personally. <laughs> um, I cannot wait to get out um, and, and experience the world and see our employees. And I think like when you talk about travel, everyone's talking about Disney World. People want to see their family. I have two brothers, younger brothers who I love dearly, and they have kids in that live in California that I haven't seen in over a year, and the kids are getting bigger. And so I think that's going to be the first, you know, travel that we're going to see. I think again, domestic travel is going to explode because everybody cannot wait to see their family again. Um, and we have lived in a very transient world in the last um, two decades where people are spread out everywhere. So I think that's going to be a huge thing we're going to start to see. And again. Um, Book your flights now. That's all I have to say because they are uh, really taking it off. So uh, there's not one obvious thing that's making people happy. During the pandemic, a lot of people uh, were happy watching TV because there was an escape. Um, my favorite show during a pandemic was definitely The Crown. I thought it was an incredible show. Um, but there were so many great shows, uh, the Michael Jordan documentary. It's the golden age of television right now. And, and now you have first run um, you know, movies coming right to the, to the small screen. So um, cooking has made a lot of people happy. We've talked a lot during our webinars about the impact of the food and beverage industry, how it's forced people, forcing fortune to get them to cook. I still cannot cook anything besides grilled cheese. My kids make fun of me all the time. Listening to music um, and hang out with friends. Um, you know, those are things making people happy. I think obviously the last one people have done uh, less of uh, during the pandemic. Um, a lot of companies obviously um, have benefited. Uh, companies like Domino's Pizza, um, you know, who are 
basically made for this moment, like Netflix in terms of delivery. Uh, the QSR category has gone through a massive transformation um, during this. It's funny, pizza is obviously in the happiness section, makes sense to me. Um, you know, you look at a company like Starbucks, you know, I am probably the most loyal Starbucks consumer that exists on this planet. Um, they have started to, and I think it's not by choice, I kind of like, I have a gravitational pull to Starbucks at around eight o'clock every morning. And it doesn't matter if I'm going to be late for a meeting, I will be at Starbucks. But what started to happen with a lot of Starbucks is, you know, obviously they've, their, their brand was built on this sort of very luxe cafe where people would hang out and do work and comfy couches. And now, obviously, when you go into a Starbucks, you'll see that you can't sit on the couches. Everything's pushed off to the side. And they really focus on their digital infrastructure, ordering coffee on the app, running in and picking it up, et cetera. And they found that they're getting great margins they're, and they think their volume is going to pick up. I think a lot of QSRs, um, you know, Chipotle is really invested in their digital infrastructure. Um, Panera is going to move to a coffee subscription model. I think you're going to see a lot of QSRs say, you know what? Maybe we don't want people eating at our restaurant anymore. Maybe this delivery and pickup is the way to go. Maybe we shouldn't invest in these physical spaces for people to eat at our place. Um, so that's going to be a ma major shift. I think you're going to start to see happen with a lot of the QSRs. You know, Duncan was, you know, all, forever was America runs on Duncan. So they were kind of the anti Starbucks, like, you know, more, a little slightly more blue collar, like run in, grab the coffee and go. You're running on Duncan. Where Starbucks was about take your time, listen to some emo music, chill out in the cafe, hang out with friends. But now Starbucks is saying, well, maybe that's not the right move. So it's going to be interesting to see kind of uh, how that ha happens um, moving forward. Uh, nearly half people have changed their views on travel, obviously, since the uh, um, onset. Um, obviously, again, there's going to be so much uh, pent up demand that's going to be unleashed. It's just really going to be interesting to see how travel and the travel industry unfolds. You are going to see airports full of people this July, this August, Mark my words right now, the travel boom that's going to happen in this country is going to be out of control. And if I'm a company like a QSR, you know, you know, uh, Starbucks, that's where people get coffee when they travel. A lot of people start to make coffee more at home, but Starbucks and Dunkin', those, when you're traveling, that's where you're going to go. Uh, and I think Airbnbs, I think th there's going to be so many huge beneficiaries of this pandemic uh, kind of coming to an end as the travel boom takes off. And it's going to be uh, really interesting. So the world, I wouldn't even say is slowly starting to work, open up. It's opening up faster than what people think um, right now. Um, travel equals happiness. It's a fact. People who travel on average are 97% more happy than those who rarely travel. Travel is sort of in our DNA. Uh, we are meant to roam. We are meant to wander. And I think that this thing is going to take off. And again, it's going to be domestic travel at first. So you know, I think it's going to be great for America because there are going to be so many destinations, you know, Myrtle Beach or um, Grand Canyon, or, you know, you go across the country to so many incredible places that have struggled so much this summer, every national park, and they're all going to be uh, the beneficiary of this because people are going to be getting out. Um, and I think, again, Airbnb is a company that is just going to absolutely explode during this because Airbnb allows people to travel, but maybe rid them of some of their safety concerns of traveling. So um, I want to bring on um, Abel um, to jump in and go over some of the questions. Uh, but this was fun. This is a great uh, presentation. And, um, you know, thanks, Abel, to you and the marketing team at Suzy, as always, for putting this great content together. It was, uh, it was fascinating to watch, Matt, just how much of what you uh, kind of talked about really resonates even with uh, me as a millennial living in New York City. So um, it's pretty cool. Um, okay, so the first question that we have here is, and I'm just going to go uh, backwards here, but uh, what brands do you associate with happiness right now? Um, overwhelming, you saw brands that kind of really assisted people during the pandemic, such as <clears throat> Amazon, um, fitness brands such as Nike, Adidas. Uh, and then you see kind of those comfort food brands such as Pepsi, Oreo, Hershey, um, you know, Starbucks, and then some of those other technology platforms like Apple, Samsung, yeah. um, that kind of come here. So that was pretty interesting to see, um, see there. And then the next question we had here was how many days a week do you plan to go back to an office here? So an overwhelming uh, amount of people said that about 27% of people said they plan to go back five days a week but almost at a similar rate of people, about 23% of people said that they do not plan 
uh, to ever go back into an office. So I think wow. that was interesting. Um, I know personally, I hey, well, you might make your screen a little bigger uh, for, yeah. for the screen. Yeah. Oh, thanks. Yeah, I know personally, I'm excited to go back to an office five days a week. Um, but it's kind of interesting to to see kind of that 23% there. So yep. um, that's being kind of three days a week. Uh, and then the next question we had here is, do you plan on making home improvements in the near future? Um, 36% said they strongly agree with that and about another 36% say that they agree with it. So I think people uh, continue to see the home as an investment. Absolutely. Uh, happiness in a place that they- I think they it's going to be a huge beneficiary of the stimulus checks as people are going to be putting it back into their home, especially over the summer, gardening, things like that. I think it's going to be huge. Uh, you know, And again, not only are stimulus checks coming in, consumer savings rates- across America are an all time high. So, you know, it's the perfect kind of recipe for people to reinvest in their homes. Um, and I think you're definitely gonna see that happen. Yeah, definitely. Um, and finally here, um, you know, do people anticipate to care more about health and wellness even more post pandemic? Um, uh, overwhelmingly, you see that people are really want yeah. to, to care about that. And that uh, makes sense. Uh, their central thing there. That so. definitely makes sense. Oh, we don't want that. Uh, Okay, <laughs> cool. So do you want to go into some Q&A, Abel? Yeah, absolutely, Matt. Um, so some of the questions that people had here was, um, you know, do you, when we talked a little bit about um, kind of experiences and people want to go to concerts and um, things like that, you know, we've seen a lot of people go back to the great outdoors uh, as part of the pandemic. Like, how do you see that kind of like outdoor travel compare with people's need to want to go to, um, you know, a massive concert or Coachella or something like that? I think the answer is yes. I think they're going to do both. I think people who love doing outdoors and hiking and, you know, hiking and outdoors activities was even big last summer because it was one of the few safe activities. Although the national parks really reined back, uh, you know, their availability of people visiting. I think you're going to see both. I think that people are going to go to concerts. Live Nation stock is at an all time high right now. So is Wind Resorts. People are going to go to casinos. Vegas is going to turn back on in a, in a huge way. And I think that you're also going to see people wanting to get outside. And, and, and especially, again, with that domestic travel boom, I think you're going to see all of it um, because people have the means to do it and their demand is there. Definitely. Um, so we've seen the uh, really cooking at home and a lot of those DIY cooking activities like baking or pasta making has really grown during the pandemic. Um, as people start to leave their homes more right. and go to restaurants, how do you think this is going to evolve yep. at home? Pandemic world. It's a great question. This goes to like that. There's only so many, so much time in a day, like what's going to miss out. I actually think cooking at home is going to be a mainstay. I think people who've learned and enjoyed and invested in their kitchen during this are going to continue to do it. I think that people are also going to spend more time in restaurants. I think the thing that people are going to be doing less of is ordering in. So I think it's that middle where I think if they're going to eat at home, they're going to cook their own food. If they're going to go out, they're going to go to a restaurant and ordering in, which was such a big uh, boom during the pandemic. I think that's going to be the one that actually, because they can't all win coming out of this, right? Because there's only so many nights a week. I think those, I think the barbell of those two things are going to uh, win out. Definitely. Um, something interesting here, Matt, is that uh, obviously a lot of different events have started to do um, kind of digital formats as part of the pandemic. Um, do you think we're going to default to in-person due to digital fatigue? Or do you think there's still going to be some sort of hybrid, um, let's say even in five years time from now? Um, I think that there's going to be hybrid uh, for sure. I think that the digital events are so very efficient. Um, you know, for us to be able to do these events for hundreds or thousands of people every week has been incredible. We're going to do it. I think that physical events are going to continue, but I think they're going to be a bit more intimate. I, I don't know if a hundred thousand person CES type events are going to be a thing anymore. I think, but I do think that personal connections are key to business. So I think that the way the, the, the winning events moving forward are going to be able to win is to be a little more intimate, private, and as a byproduct safe. Um, and I think, I think, at the same time, online events is going to continue to boom because people get value from it, clearly. Uh, Matt, one question here that people want to know about is kind of, can you tell us a little bit about the source of the data that you're referencing throughout the presentation? Yeah. So Suzy has its own proprietary uh, consumer panel of over a million consumers census weighted about against census-based criteria. They are living on a mobile app called CrowdTap, C R O W D. Tap, uh, which is both on iOS and Android. And we've been building this audience out. We have a great team that's focused on it. Um, and having our own proprietary panel gives our research tool uh, kind of attributes that no other tool does in the industry. 
Definitely. Um, so one question that someone had here is that um, obviously a lot of the uh, tech companies have really embraced this kind of permanent work from home, but some of the smaller companies and brands that have more traditional, um, you know, traditional uh, infrastructure, um, you know, have been a little less, uh, you know, yeah. into it kind of going into the future. Like, what are your thoughts on that? Like, is this just a tech thing or is this going to kind of so I actually think even on the tech side, it's overblown. I mean, Facebook just took massive real estate investment in New York City, as did Amazon during the pandemic. I think they want people to have the optionality of a distributed workforce. And a lot of tech companies sort of are able to be remote a lot easier. But I actually think tech companies are, you know, are going to like Microsoft has said they they really do want to invest in the office again. A lot of tech companies do believe in the power of it. Goldman Sachs, you know, David Solomon, CEO of Goldman Sachs said work from home, a full time work from home is not a thing. So I think that I don't think it's going to be a black or white shift. I think a lot of companies are going to kind of end up somewhere in the middle where, again, I think the tools and the culture is such that working from home will be more acceptable. But I do think companies will also at the same time really invest in culture and the ability to bring people together. Definitely. Um, and Matt, just one final question for you. Um, so you kind of mentioned that a lot of these big cities are seeing really depressed uh, real estate markets. Um, and that's a really good time for brands to kind of start taking advantage yeah. of them. In your best kind of prediction, like how long do you think this trend is going to last for? Uh, of just more depressed markets. I think you're, you're at six to nine months. We're going to, I think it's going to be a quick bounce back. I really do. I think that the market has moved so quick in terms of the uh, kind of increased cost of suburban homes coming at the expense of decreased prices. Um, I think one thing that will slow down the uh, real estate market overall is rising interest rates. Uh, so treasury yields on 10 year bonds were, um, you know, an all time peak a couple of years ago. That means that we're entering an inflationary period and it means that prices are going to become more expensive. And interest rates are going to rise. So people are not going to be able to afford homes as easily as they have during the summer of 2020 and 2021 and beyond. So that will, I think, create some headwinds for the real estate industry uh, moving forward. But I do think there will be a kind of a shift back um, to cities for sure. Awesome. All right, Matt, that's all the questions that we have from the audience. But again, awesome. thank you. Thank everybody. Yeah, thank you guys. And on behalf of Abel, myself, and the Suzy team, thanks for joining yet another edition of our State of the Consumer webinar. We have a bunch more amazing content in store for you guys, uh, whether you're on the road or at home. So I just want to thank everybody for your time. Uh, thank you for your continued support and safe, stay safe, everyone. So until next time, uh, we'll see everyone soon.